Our kids' sermon quiz this week. What color is spoken of repeatedly in the sermon? Is it blue, yellow, green, or all of the above? Number two, what gemstone was seen in heaven? Now, there are many gemstones mentioned as being seen in heaven in the Bible. I'm talking about specifically in the sermon. Okay? And then number three, what color crayons were used? That will become evident later what that's about. If you are keeping count of a special word today, uh, children, to help you follow along with the message, your word for today is blue. If you forget what the word is, just look at the color of the backdrop behind us and you'll remember it's the word blue. And if you keep count of that, uh, you can see our lollipop lady, Sister Bev, in the foyer at the welcome desk to report in how many times you counted uh, that word and uh, receive your treat today. Again, kids, we, we want to make it uh, easy for you to follow along and encourage you to follow along with the message. We continue uh, with our Politics and Power Sermon series. Today's message is titled, Blue Authority. Public servants in ancient Rome wore blue. Interesting to note that that's why, when you trace it down, police are our men in blue today. We live in an age where law and order are being undermined on many different fronts. This is nothing new as we will see. And as we examine law and order, certain types of laws, we're going to wrestle with the question today, that might have a surprising answer for some of you. What blue laws must be kept? A quick review. Last time we were together, we talked about uh, a second beast of Revelation 13 had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And we saw that the land beast represents the United States of America. Now, we love our nation. And I believe that the United States is the greatest nation in the world, and I'm very thankful for it. But what I'm remembering in Bible prophecy is that Satan is the one, Revelation 20, who deceives the nations. Even ancient Israel, a nation clearly raised up by God for a special purpose, was led astray and corrupted. And so that is a consequence of many things in the world today. And Bible prophecy reveals that will ultimately be the case with all the nations of the earth, including our beloved United States. Now we see of uh, that power in Revelation 13 that it will make an image to the beast who had a wound by the sword and has come to life. We're talking about a union of church and state. A union of um, political and uh, religious belief mixed together. Let's go one step farther than last week. What is one way that um, this image could begin to form. Uh, well, could it be a strengthening of the earthly uh, blue laws, the also termed as Sunday laws, which are on the books in 28 states? Are there folk that desire to do that in our world today? What blue laws must be kept? Well, in uh, 2018 National Catholic Register, it says taking Sunday seriously, Poland leads the way. The, Europe's, uh, the, the European nation's new law sharply restricting Sunday shopping provides an opportunity to take a closer look at American habits. Uh, in Poland, where it's now majority uh, Catholic, uh, Poland now has things shut down, stores shut down on Sunday. In fact, only seven times a year can a store be open on Sunday in uh, Poland. And they're suggesting, hey, it's time for America to take a closer look at this. And so, what blue laws must be kept? Well, here's another thing to look at. June 17, 2020, bring back the blue laws. Casey Chalk, Crisis Magazine, a voice for the faithful Catholic laity. In March 2020, Mayor Cam Guthrie on his Twitter page said, Once we kick COVID-19's um, derriere, I suggest that everything be closed on Sundays again. The thought exists out there. It's in our world today. And um, it's one thing that a lot of people think would be a good idea. And growing up in the Baptist church, there's a time in my life where I would have thought, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. That's a great idea. The waning moral decay in our country, just, you know, it would remind everybody every week. I mean, uh, you know, uh, any time that, that um, 
that, that we come across this, things closed, uh, a time for family, a time for rest, it would be a reminder and help bring people back to God. It would have made sense to me at one point in my life. But what blue laws must be kept? Uh, we're told in the uh, apocalyptic classic, The Great Controversy, it will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath. That this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced. And that those who present the claims of the fourth commandment, thus destroying reverence for Sunday, are troublers of the people, preventing their restoration to divine favor and temporal prosperity. Now the purpose of today's message is not to alarm or to scare anyone. Or rather, to uh, remind us that we need to prepare for what's ahead and we need to renew our first love and we need to live as though we believe the time is short and we need to care for people uh, as if their eternal salvation is at stake because it is. So what blue laws must be kept? Well, blue laws by state in 2020, uh, 28 states in our country currently have blue laws on the books. And these are, are laws that are on the books to, uh, and some are not enforced, but others are in certain places for the due sanctification of Sunday and to guard it as a day of worship. And so, why are they called blue laws? Well, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica suggests that the reason they're called blue laws is when they were put into place in the late 1700s in Connecticut that they were written on, yes, you guessed it, blue paper. Uh, the more likely scenario, though, simply may be that blue was considered the color of rigid uh, morality and um, was associated with uh, God's law. And so that's why the color blue was chosen. Let me share with you an old quote, but uh, it brings out a point for us today. It says, Protestantism and discarding the authority of the church has no good reason for its Sunday theory and ought logically to keep Saturday as the Sabbath. The state, in passing laws for the due sanctification of Sunday, is unwittingly acknowledging the authority of the Catholic Church and carrying out, more or less faithfully, its prescriptions. Now, whether you believe uh, uh, or agree with that statement or not, that is what uh, the um, Catholic scholars have, have claimed. John Gilmary Shea, in particular, at this point, uh, back in 1883 in the American Catholic Quarterly Review. So what blue laws must be kept? I'm an advocate that certain blue laws must be observed, should be observed, absolutely. And before you, th uh, you know, write me off and go, what, what in the world is he talking about? Uh, perhaps you might give me time to explain and stay with me. Uh, as we develop this, I want to share with you right here uh, something else that is concerning me. This is from the news right now. Um, you have uh, Catholics in the U.S. Supreme Court. You have Kavanaugh, Thomas... Uh, Roberts, Alito, Sotomayor, and uh, that's five of nine. Five of nine U.S. Supreme Court justices, five of nine constitutes a majority of one religion. And then Neil Gorsuch was raised Catholic, and he's presently Episcopal, which, if you're familiar with Anglican and Episcopal, is very, very close to Catholic. And so um, it's also interesting that, I mean, there's not a Baptist, there's not a Pentecostal. There's not a non-denominational Christian up there on the U.S. Supreme Court. Not one. Not a single one. And yet, the other three, of course, uh, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg has now passed, are Jewish. Now, that's very interesting if you think of a... Uh, if, if, if anyone ever starts to really try to promote blue laws to the forefront to strengthen Sunday laws, blue laws in the United States... It's kind of interesting the way that is set up. Can you not imagine it would make for a very interesting discussion for Catholics and Jews to talk about the Sabbath and Sunday? It's as if something perhaps could be in the works right now. I don't know. I can't predict the future and I'm not trying to. There are certain things that we are told, other things we are not. But it certainly seems as though some things could be lining up. And also I will add, of course, I'm no legal expert, but at least my opinion of the United States Constitution and especially uh, the amendments is that blue laws really ought to be unconstitutional. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Right? Right? And yet, as we are now facing a Supreme Court battle, um, you know, uh, New York Times was comfortable enough last night by 9 p.m. to say that Trump uh, is going to nominate uh, Amy Barrett 
Uh, I checked the news just before I came out again, and had the, the official announcement had not been made, but the New York Times was comfortable enough in their sources to say that Trump selects her. And so uh, we'll see if that turns out to be the case. And, uh, but the other lady that was in the front running for it, uh, Barbara Lagoya of Florida, a uh, Cuban-American judge, uh, she's also Roman Catholic. So both, both of the front runners. And uh, so what's going on here? That just, uh, I would not be for any one religion holding a majority of the U.S. Supreme Court. If it were Baptist or Adventist or Methodist, I would be opposed of any one religious denomination to hold a majority of the U.S. Supreme Court. Five is a majority. Six is more like a super majority. Think about it. But what blue laws must be kept? And if the blue laws were to become a constitutional issue in our country, is the court being uh, uh, loaded with, with um, persons of a certain religious bent something that may affect outcome? I don't know, but I wonder about it. And it certainly concerns me today. Regardless of your political affiliation and red state, blue state, and all of that, uh, what you think of uh, whether it's... Um, regardless of when you worship the lamb, whether you're trying to bring in a donkey or an elephant or you leave it all out of it, I can tell you that it concerns me personally. But what blue laws must be kept? Well, go with me to Revelation chapter 17. We've studied in Revelation 13. We've studied elsewhere. We've been developing our politics and power series. We've looked at several key points. I will not review any more uh, today, except to say that our next stop in politics and power takes us to Revelation chapter 17. In Revelation chapter 17, I want you to notice what is not there. If you say, how can you notice what's not there? Well, good luck with that. It says in verse 1, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show thee the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. We're talking politics and power. The kings of the earth, okay? And she sits on many waters. The verse 15 tells us the waters are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So this woman, a woman in Bible prophecies, a church, uh, this church has global influence, uh, Peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues, many waters, right? And uh, influences, at least in the very end, the kings of the earth, and ultimately through them and through her own influence, it says, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication, her false teachings. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And it says, And on her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. So other illicit women of the book of Revelation uh, uh, come forth from her and abominations of the earth. So what's missing and why? Usually when you preach upon a passage, you're preaching about what is in the passage. And yet today, we're going to turn that upside down, and we're going to preach about what we did not just read. Say, that doesn't make any sense. Well, stay with me. What is not in the passage? We're going to come back to that in just a moment. But first, who is this woman? Well, a woman in prophecy is a church, a harlot's an impure woman. She sits on many waters, so she has that global influence. Uh, her colors are purple and scarlet. She deceives the whole world through her false teachings or wine. She's referred to as Babylon, which uh, 1 Peter 5.13 was a code word for Rome. When Peter wrote from Rome, uh, the church that is at Babylon salutes you. He was using, uh, uh, using it as a code word so that he would not bring undue persecution upon the church there. Mother of harlots in Revelation 17.5, identified by the abominations, mother of abominations, and you find... Um, uh, the idea that when you die, you're not really dead is one of those abominations in Ezekiel, as well as a counterfeit of, uh, of, of true worship, particularly the Sabbath Sunday issue. And then persecutes the saints, sits on seven hills or mountains, and is also a city. Now, how could uh, a power be both a church, a woman in prophecy, and a city? Well, the Vatican has figured out how to pull that one off, have they not? Yes, and Rome is the city of seven hills. She sits on seven mountains. Fits every one of these points, but that is not the point of the message today. It's simply something that we must review from studies past. 
to be able to move ahead with our message today. You see, we're talking about what is missing in Revelation 17, and uh, it's going to become important as we move ahead. There are three main colors in the sanctuary. Um, you have, have them use gold, but then also what? Blue, purple, and what? Scarlet. And uh, that's the wilderness sanctuary. Now, gold and white were there too. Gold and white, certainly. The fine linen, and when you see fine linen mentioned, and the woman was arrayed in fine linen, and, and, uh, or, or had fine linen, you see in Revelation 18. And so you have the white, you have the gold, with the three colors that are emphasized and mentioned over 25 times together in the context of the sanctuary are blue and purple, and it says crimson in Second Chronicles, which is also scarlet or red. And so these three colors, blue and purple and red, blue, purple, and red, over 25 times they appear, not just for the wilderness sanctuary, but for Solomon's temple, as you see in Second Chronicles uh, there, over 25 times. So what is missing in the key passage we looked at in Revelation 17? The woman was arrayed in uh, what? Purple and scarlet and red and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. What is missing in the passage? She has the sanctuary colors, but one is missing. Blue. Why? What blue laws must be kept? Numbers 15.39 says, And you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments. It was a blue tassel that the men of Israel would put uh, at the four corners, if you will. One on the left and right in the front and one on the left and right in the back so that they would remember to walk in the law of God. And so the blue was for the commandments. Okay? Now, what blue laws must be kept? I'm, I'm an advocate of keeping the blue laws that are supposed to be kept, and I'll explain that to you. What blue laws must be kept? When the camp prepares to journey, this is the wilderness sanctuary being broken down, when Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, when it was time for them to break camp and move on, uh, when the camp prepares to journey, they shall cover the ark of the testimony entirely of what? Of blue. Now, there were, there were blue and purple and red were used for various things, but on the outside, all the other articles of furniture for the sanctuary were covered in leather and were covered, uh, you know, basically a, a drab color, if you will, on the outside, or, 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 or a different color on the outside. The only one that was blue on the outside was the Ark of the Covenant. In fact, if you were standing on a mountain watching the children of Israel come by, you would know exactly where the Ark of the Covenant was because it would be the blue dot moving along down there. It was covered on the outside with blue. Now, inside the Ark were uh, Aaron's rod that budded and uh, a pot of manna, but also, more specifically, the what? Ten Commandment, moral law of God, God's law of love that is summed up by love God and love your neighbor as yourself. The first three commandments about loving God, the last five about our relationships to others. And so covered in blue. But it gets even more, more significant than that, in my opinion. Watch this as this develops just a bit, please. You see, the Ark of the Covenant was not just a depository for the Ten Commandments. It was symbolic of something much grander. That's right. On top of the ark was a lid of solid gold called the mercy seat, about 55 inches uh, long and about 33 inches wide. And on top of that were the two golden angels whose wings touched at the tip, symbolizing Psalms 80 and verse 1 tells us the very throne of God, which is between the two angel cherubs. And so there you have now the blue tied to the throne of God and the Ten Commandments there as part of it. But it gets more interesting as we think about what blue laws must be kept. Are you starting to wonder what blue laws I might be talking about yet? Well, as we look at our next part, Ezekiel 1, and turn to Ezekiel 10. We're going to look that one up. But Ezekiel 1, we put on the screen. And it says, And above the firmament, over their heads, was the likeness of a, a throne. A throne. In the appearance like a, what kind of stone? 
like a sapphire stone. Kids, for your kids' sermon quiz, we're talking about what gemstone was seen in heaven. And it says the likeness of a throne in the appearance of a sapphire stone. Are you there in Ezekiel chapter 10 yet? Let me join you there. So Ezekiel chapter 10. And it says here in verse 1, And I looked, and there in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubim, there appeared something like a sapphire stone having the appearance of the likeness of a throne. Now, sapphire is what color? Blue. And so, when they were shown a vision of heaven, they saw a throne of sapphire stone. The throne of God. The blue stone throne. Well, perhaps the wheels are turning just a bit for us. What blue laws must be kept? Go with me, would you, to Exodus chapter 24. We're going to start in verse 9. I'm going to put verse 10 on the screen, but verse 12 is particularly important and it's not going to be on the screen, so you're going to want to look this up. And it says here in Exodus 24, starting in verse 9, greet your Bible out. If you didn't bring your Bible, uh, maybe your smartphone, look this up. You're going, to, you're going to want to mark this, perhaps. It says in verse 9, Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. So these are the leaders of Israel, Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under His feet, as it were, a paved work of... What kind of stone? Sapphire stone. That's a what color stone? Blue stone. Sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens in its clarity. Like the very heaven, like the blue sky in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. They saw God and they ate and drank. Now the Bible says no man can see God and live. And yet on these men, they saw God. He did not lay his hand. He, he had a special provision for them to be able to see. Perhaps he shielded his glory. It doesn't really tell us in the passage at least. So they saw this blue stone pavement, sapphire, and they ate in God's presence. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of take a little bit of diversion for just a moment, so bear with me. They were eating in the presence of God. I've known some uh, folk, usually uh, older, that would say, they, 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 they've getting been out of shape and come to me. It hasn't happened at this church, but other churches where I pastored, that maybe some mom was giving her kids Cheerios in church to kind of keep them going. And they're like, they shouldn't be eating in the sanctuary. I'm going, have you ever studied why the showbread was in the Old Testament sanctuary? It was to be eaten in the presence of God in the sanctuary. I remember in Tacoma, we had a big foyer and. We had refreshments there after church every week. We had a veggie tray usually for health conscious folks and uh, nice cookies for the guest because that's typically how that would break down. And uh, we, we did that because people would slow down and we could connect. Have all the time people come to church and leave. And you, you, oh, we got fellowship meal. Come to, they're not going to go to another building, but they'll pause long enough to eat a cookie and drink a drink. And you can start a conversation and you can connect. And we started so many Bible studies and I believe it was an evangelistic tool. And if we ever, you know, do some expansion or anything here, I would love to have a big, nice foyer where we, we can mingle and do those things, you know, when we can stand within six foot of each other again, Lord willing. Otherwise, we need a really, really big foyer. And we had... Um, a lady in the church there that when we started doing this, she got really upset and she came to me and she said, Pastor, we have a fellowship hall in the other building and that's where we're supposed to eat and eating food over here in God's house is an abomination. So, wow. Man. Well, in, in the Bible, they, they went to the temple and ate in God's presence. 
Well, uh, we have a fellowship hall and it's, it's an abomination. Uh, what, what does that door say right, right there? Uh, women. I said, now, what, what's the purpose of what's behind that door? Well, I'm not going to talk about that, Pastor. You know what that's for. I'm like, so it's okay to do that over here in God's house, but we can't eat a cookie. I said, sister, I love you. I love our church. Jesus is going to come back. And come to find out she was worried about the carpet in the foyer. That, that, that became the issue as we talked. She was afraid that someone was going to spill juice on the carpet. And, uh, and I already had had another member that came to me and said, Pastor, if the carpet ever gets stained, I'm going to pay to replace it. I love what we're doing. So I told her that. And she goes, oh, and I, I shared with her, I said, Sister, we want to keep a nice building, but when Jesus comes back, the people that stained the carpet, He's going to take to heaven and burn the building down. So let's focus on that. What do you say? Okay, Pastor, let's do it. And we marched forward and it did great. But so they were eating and drinking in the presence of God. They saw the blue sapphire pavement. Now, the blue stone. Notice the next verse. Let me open my Bible back up and get there with you. And so we're in Exodus 24. And it says here in verse 12, The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain, and I will give you... I'm in verse 12. Come up on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and commandments which I have written that you may teach them. We're told elsewhere, such as in this book, Exodus 31, 18, the Ten Commandments are written on the tablets with the finger of God. But it says own stone. But we miss a little something in English that, that Hebrew scholars picked up on. In fact, Jewish scholars, I'll quote in just a moment. And that is, the Hebrew of Exodus 24, 12 actually reads, tables of the stone. Meaning the stone that's already being talked about in the passage. What stone was being talked about in the passage? The sapphire stone. It literally is saying, I will give you tables of the stone. Here's what the Hebrew um, Jewish uh, scholars have said in this book, The Legends of the Jews. Ancient Jewish scholars state that the sapphire employed for the tables was taken from the throne of glory. You see, in Ezekiel, they looked up into heaven and they saw the blue stone throne. The Ten Commandments were in the Ark of the Covenant representing the throne of God covered in blue when it came time to move them. Moses departed from the heavens with the two tables on which the Ten Commandments were engraved and were made of a sapphire-like stone. Again, Jewish scholars and legends both say. That's interesting. Blue laws crafted from God's throne. In today's land, we have blue laws written on paper to control people's actions on a certain day of the week. In heaven's court, blue laws are written on blue stone to demonstrate the loving character of God. Will you keep the blue laws? Blue was the color of the law. The blue tassels that hung so that they would remember to walk within God's law. The blue covering over the Ark of the Covenant. When they saw God's throne, it was blue sapphire stone. And they saw the blue sapphire when they met with God and saw God. And they were then given, Moses was given, tables of the stone. Now that would have been an original set. We know what happened if we've read the Bible. Moses came down from the mountain. All Israel was breaking the second of the Ten Commandments, worshiping around a golden calf. And the object lesson, if you violate one, you're guilty of all, found in James 2.10. And Moses threw them on the ground and they broke to pieces. And then they had to get another set, which it tells us that God wrote on those tablets too, but that Moses had to hew them out. Two tablets like the first. 
And so some have speculated that the second set was probably not on sapphire, it's probably on granite or some such. But nonetheless, what are the implications for the original set of the Ten Commandments that come from the blue stone throne? Well, if the Ten Commandments are on that blue sapphire stone from heaven, from God's throne, can they be changed? Can they be altered? Can they be disregarded? Well, no more than the throne of God itself could be. And yet, we're told of the end time deceiving power that he would think he could change God's times and laws. No one can change God's law, but this power would think it could pull it off at least among men. But the Bible says in Revelation 12, and the dragon was wroth with the woman. In this case, it's a pure woman, God's faithful people. Went to make war with the remnant of her seed. And by the way, there's the other woman and, and the daughters and uh, representing the churches with the idea that when you die, you're not really dead or Sunday sacredness in the place of the Sabbath. But let me tell you something. Don't look down your nose at folks. Don't think you're any better than anybody else. I grew up in the Baptist church. I grew up believing both of those false teachings. But I grew up believing in and worshiping God and trusting in Jesus as my Savior. And when the message goes forth, the message of prophecy that we are called to proclaim in these last days, along with that message is the call from the voice from heaven in Revelation 18.4 that says, Come out of her my people. That's it. My people. Jesus looks down from heaven and sees followers that they may not have some of the scriptural truths you and I have been blessed with. They may have some we haven't been, by the way. We learn from each other. But they may not have some of the scriptural truths we've been blessed with, but Jesus calls them... What? His people. Be careful what you do when you talk about other groups because you just might be talking about God's people and He might have issue with you. He says, come out of her who? My people. Lest you share in her sins and receive of her plagues. But the dragon was wroth with the woman, the faithful, the, the woman in white, the, the people of God that, that are following Jesus uh, uh, more fully. Uh, they, they're keeping His commandments, in other words. And went to make war with the remnant, the rest of her offspring, which keep the what? Commandments of God. These are the commandments from the blue stone throne and have the testimony of Jesus. They're focused on Jesus. We talked about the dragon. The dragon is angry. He was defeated at the cross, but the battle still rages until Jesus comes back. But my friends, don't lose hope no matter how bad life gets because the dragon slayer is coming. But will you keep the blue laws? Revelation 14, 12. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Again, the commandments because they believe and focus on Jesus. How to love God, the first four commandments. How to love others, uh, the last six. Now, sin is a violation of the life-sustaining principle of love spelled out in God's law. And as we consider this, we're told in Romans 3.20, by the law is the knowledge of sin. We live in a day and age where in secular society, people have no concept of sin because they have no moral compass that clearly tells right and wrong. Everybody in a secular society is struggling with moral relativity, trying to figure out for themselves what is right and wrong, looking at socially acceptable standards in society and governing themselves in that. And so it's really hard to help people understand you need Jesus and you need the gospel to save you from your sin when because of the disregard of God's law and morality, they do not see things as sinful. There are three colors we've been talking about. 
blue, red, and purple. The woman in Revelation 17 was in purple and scarlet. She had the purple and the red, but no blue. Sometimes she has the same commandments or rules as God. In fact, shares several of them, but then others are changed or altered or substituted. Red is the color in the Bible of war, of judgment, and also of blood, especially the blood of Jesus. Blue is the color of the law. When you mix red and blue together, what color do you actually get in real life? Purple. You see, it was the demands of a holy law. God's law of love that had been violated and broken. That required the shedding of blood. Or without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Jesus came. And, and, and here's the paradox. He lived a perfect life following perfectly the law of God. He was not under condemnation by the blue. Pulled over by the cops, he would not have been nervous. He was not condemned by the blue. At all. And yet, he took our place and he went and offered his life. And the Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. And through the perfect life, embodying the law of God. By the way, if the law of God could have been changed, Jesus would not have needed to die. He just changed the law. He changed the law and then what was against the law is no longer against the law. Like, you know, you, 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 you dodged the draft at Vietnam and you were in trouble until they pardoned all of them and now it wasn't against the law anymore and so now you're okay. But it just pardoned everybody because they'd changed the law, but the law could not be changed because it, God Himself can't be changed and it's the character of God and who He is wrote down. And so the perfect obedience to the law and then His shed blood in the place of you and me and we see His royalty, purple the color of royalty, shine forth in the perfect sacrifice. Because in the sanctuary service, the ashes of the sacrifice were covered in purple. Jesus' perfect sacrifice is in my place and yours. Will you trust anew in the red Jesus' death to fulfill the requirements of the broken blue law to accept the perfect royal purple sacrifice of Jesus? Let's go over our kid sermon quiz, which I forgot to put at the end. There we go. Kid sermon quiz. What color is spoken of repeatedly? Is it blue, yellow, green, or all of the above? Blue. What gemstone was seen in heaven? Was it a diamond, a ruby, an onyx, or a sapphire? Sapphire. What color crayons were used? Yellow, red, and pink. Blue, red, and purple. B. Or C. Green, red, and orange. B. Blue, red, and purple. And how many times did we say the word blue today? Well, that's for Sister Bev to say. She's the expert. I don't know. But you kids can go and see her, and sometimes the big kids go and get lollipops too. Uh, don't, don't act like I don't know that some of you who are grown up haven't been hashtagging how many times we said blue all the way through the whole sermon. You can get a lollipop too. I think we can afford it in the budget. All right. Stand with me. We're going to close in prayer. Thank you today. As you go forth this week and you see the color blue, when you see that blue sky... When you see the blue shirt, when you see blue, think of God's throne and the blue stone law. Loving Father, we thank you for the honor and privilege we've had to wrestle with Scripture today. 
to look at what was missing in Revelation 17. And Lord, help us to realize why it's important and shouldn't be missing in our lives and in our beliefs as we surrender to follow you because of your perfect sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.